I am so excited for today's interview with a colleague of mine that I connected with on, of all things, Instagram. Uh, Dr. Becky Kennedy, her work on parenting is so in alignment, and she has a new book coming out called Good Inside, and I'm super excited to introduce her to you all. So who is Dr. Becky Kennedy? Dr. Becky Kennedy is a Columbia University-trained clinical psychologist and mom of three who is rethinking the way we raise our children. Named the Millennial Parent Whisperer by Time Magazine, she specializes in thinking deeply about what's happening for our children and translating these ideas into simple, actionable steps for parents to use in their homes with their own kids. Dr. Becky's goal is to empower parents to feel sturdier and more equipped to handle all of the different challenges that they might face raising their kids. Today, she's with us to discuss and explore her new book, Good Inside, which will be released this coming September. I'm so excited for this conversation. Super excited. Thank you so much, Dr. Becky Kennedy, for joining me here today to talk about your new book, Good Inside. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I can't wait to have what I know will be a really important and really fun conversation. Absolutely. I can't even remember at this point when you and I crossed social media paths, but I do know being so blown away um, by your work and how you translate um, a lot of these big ideas, um, especially in the world of parenting. And I do want to, I think, begin with our field and what we had thought for a long time in terms of parenting and the model of really how to instruct, even though I don't really love that word, but mentor, give parents the tools Um, I think all of us kind of acknowledging that while I'm not a parent, so I can't speak to that myself, when we do come to the stage of our life where we have children, I do think a lot of us very much have the intention of, you know, showing up, doing things a bit differently and really helping shape our child's lives ultimately. And again, in the field, and we could, I think, perhaps start there. I don't think we've been given the really understandable, practical even efficient, effective, I don't even know how, how to describe it, the way to understand parenting and really translate the tools into action, I think has largely been lacking. So I, since I saw your work and the way you kind of thought about parenting and really talked about it in such that understanding and applicable way, I just think it's so incredibly necessary for these future generations. Oh, thank you. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree there. I mean, I, I started working with all these parents in my practice and realized that some of them, they really weren't looking for therapy. They were maybe looking to work on some things in themselves, but they were presenting because their kid was really struggling and it just dysregulated the whole family system. And what what happened next is I actually said, okay, well, I want to get extra training in how to work with parents. Like, I feel like that's something I was like, well, when you want to do something new, you get extra training. And so I went to one of these centers that claims to be like this evidence-based center. And as someone who likes science, I was like, I like evidence. Like, I think, <laughs> sure, everything, that sounds good. I want that. And, and it was all about timeouts and punishments and sticker charts and rewards and ignoring and attending. And I have to be honest, I'll just say it right out. Like at first I was like, this is amazing. Like, I, I know exactly what to do. This makes so much sense because it does in your brain, like pure logic is like, yes, yes, yes. That makes sense. Get more of the good, extinguish the bad. And I literally heard myself giving guidance to a parent in my practice. And I literally stopped my, I was like, I really don't even believe what I'm saying. Like, I actually don't know how to help you right now, but this isn't it. So like at the very least, I'm going to refund you, but like, (laughs) and then what struck me after was like, I know the way I work with adults in therapy. I know what ends up helping them, like the work they do. And why can't we take that and that information and that process and like reverse engineer that back to parents in a way that they can interact with their kids and help their kids when they struggle in a way that would support development in the long term, would build the skills that we want our kids to have at 22 and 40. And of course, if you don't have them at 22 and 40, it's never too late. Right. Um, And yet, like, it's, it's hard, you know, it's a thing to do. And so that's really what guided me. And, you know, I think one of the things about timeouts and punishments and sticker charts that I, I, I appreciate 
is as a parent, you just want to know what to do. Like feeling invested as a parent, which every parent does, loving your kid and seeing your kid struggle, it's really, really hard and painful. And what makes it like just beyond painful is to think like, I don't even know what to do. That's a horrible feeling. And knowing that timeouts and sticker charts, they're so concrete and they do give parents clarity. I realized like if I'm going to try to do something different and put it into a system, it has to be as clear and as concrete as those other approaches. Because I feel like at the end of the day, when we're overwhelmed, we choose clarity over anything else. And so that's like what I set out to do. And then this book really puts it all in one place, a totally different approach. Yeah. I think you're really you know, speaking a truth there and acknowledging that, you know, when we're, when one is overwhelmed, um, we really do. And I mean, not to speak for you, but I know having had what sounds like a similar experience in a treatment room with clients for me, feeling disempowered, not fully believing what I'm saying. And, or if I did believe it, not seeing the change, the evidence. And so not having the, what to offer next, the concrete tool, or even more so complicated when you don't see the concrete tools as necessarily changing the behaviors, then it does feel overwhelming. And I can imagine being the parent, again, knowing how it felt to be the clinician who's supposed to be the helper, imagine yeah. that times a thousand where you do very much, you know, understand to some level that you do need to be the sturdy leader to use your language. You do need to show up in service of your child and their needs, but not knowing the how, I think really just complicates it. And you wrote something really beautiful um, in terms of this discussion. And you said, switching the parenting mindset from consequences or this idea of behaviorism, like the charts, the stickers, um, that kind of reward or punishment idea around behavior in particular. And you offer um, the very wise need for changing, switching the mindset from consequences to connections and going on to say, to say that understanding that behaviors itself are only the tip of an iceberg. I love a visual and that below the surface, is the child's entire, entire internal world just begging to be understood and just having that visual again, right? So clinically for so long, all we're focusing on is that tip, um, reacting to that tip from a very well-intentioned way, but not seeing everything below it. And yes, look, and behaviorism is just so steeped in our culture, at least in America, I can't like, it is just, it's an education. It's in child rearing, like to the point that like, we've just accepted it as a truth. Like, I feel like it's been moved to like the nonfiction area of the <laughs> library. Like, I don't know how exactly that happened, but when you take out a book from nonfiction, you expect it to be true. So, you know, and that idea of behavior is the tip of the iceberg. I think what parents who are kind of new to some of these ideas, which is most people, because again, we weren't parented this way, they'll say something like, okay, so if I'm not punishing my kid for hitting, let's say her sister, then like you do nothing, like it's just okay to hit. And it's this really either or mindset, right? Where the assumption under that is that if I don't punish a behavior, um, condoning a behavior. If I don't punish a behavior, my kid's going to do more of that behavior. And I think at the very least, it's just, it's a really nasty view of human development to think that people develop in this behavioral way. And I think like anyone listening right now, if you have a, let's say, if you have a partner, you have a friend and you just had a horrible, horrible day, like it was just everything. You spilled your coffee in the beginning. You got yelled at, you lost <laughs> you know, a $20 bill, whatever. And then if you came home, and your partner said to you, like, oh, you didn't unload the dishwasher? Just like, you know, and like enough. You're like, you, you, just, you don't want to say that to me, right? And then you say, like, you don't do anything. And, you know, like, why don't you unload? Like, you just totally have this, you know, big, quote, disproportionate reaction. Because, right, let's say you say that. Like, I'm just picturing me in that moment. If my husband said to me, I that is it. Go to your room and no TV for a week, okay? Like, or I am taking away that necklace I bought you yesterday. Okay. Like, I don't think that makes me any less likely to yell at him, probably more likely to yell at him. <laughs> if alternatively, he said, you know, Becky, whoa, something is going on. And like, I need a moment because whoa. And I also really don't like when you talk to me that way. And you must be having a really hard time with things beyond what I asked you to have reacted that way. And I, I'm going to cry thinking about this. Um, maybe my husband will watch this and say this to me one day. Um, if he said like, I care more about what you're struggling with 
than the thing you just said to me. So like, let's just both cool off and like figure this out together. Like, I just want to know the person who after would be like, oh my goodness, my husband just gave me permission to yell at him. I'm going to be more likely to yell at him because he condoned that. Like, it's right. just not how we work. Like, it's like, we're so afraid that if you see a kid under a struggle, like that's what sets things off the rails. Like it's just, and it's so important to come back, I think to ourselves, like, yeah, no, I wouldn't be more likely to yell. Like I need that. I would need that. I, and the, that I think is so the source of truth of like where I try to come back to is just reminding myself, my kid is not some like animal that is trying to be trained into compliance. My kid is closer to me. And like, what would I need? And what do humans need? And it's all the same stuff at any age. <laughs> right. Well, I think what you're getting to is another quote that I really want to highlight. And I believe really what is the foundation of your, your movement of, you know, good inside parenting of even the title of your book where you write. And I think this is so beautiful. I'm actually getting chills even thinking about it. Um, and it very much aligns, you know, kind of with, with my belief. And what you say is you speak of the principle of internal goodness. We are all good inside. At our core, we are compassionate, loving, and generous. And, you know, as I, I talk a lot about heart centered and going back and where I locate what makes us us, whatever you want to call it spirit, soul, intuition, essence, that thing. Again, I, I locate that in the organ of care, of compassion. So, very much in alignment. And talk to me about, you know, and how this is, I think, a big shift. And I think, kind of, what we're talking about here, if we can drop back into this idea of internal goodness. Yes. Um, I do think that is really foundational in what I see and hear from your work. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't think anyone will walk into, uh, you know, a therapist or psychologist or parent coach's office and that person's ever going to say, well, I believe kids are bad inside. So here's right. what we do. Like no one says that, but all of these more behavior first approaches that are really based in behavior shaping and control than they are in anything else. The only reason you need to control someone is because you don't trust them. Like I think control and trust are opposites, right? The only reason you need to so carefully shape someone's behavior is because you don't believe that internally they have some internal goodness drive that would bring out that behavior. Like the only reason I need to say we're over to my kid, say thank you, say thank you, <laughs> thank you, parent, thank you. Because like, I don't think over time they'll develop that impulse from intrinsic motivation. And so while no one explicitly says kids are bad inside, because if anyone said that, we'd be like, that, that just sounds wrong. I don't believe that. So much child psychology and parenting psychology kind of guidance, I actually think is based in that assumption. I really do. And when you realize, or you, if you believe, or you try to experiment with the belief, even that, like, okay, my kid is good inside. The reason I think it's so powerful is not because then it's an anything goes approach. Like I've never said like, well, my kid is good inside, so I don't care that they spit at me because they're good enough. <laughs> Obviously not, it just like, doesn't even make sense. Of course I care, but it creates a gap between my kid's internal goodness and their not so good behavior. behavior. And if you have a gap in that way, you can start being curious. And like, to me, that's where we all win, like in that curiosity space. Like, why is my kid who's good inside spitting at me? Why is my kid who's good inside lying to my face? Why is my kid who's good inside hitting her sister? Like, and now if I can have that gap between a behavior, which is not so great and a kid who's good inside, now I can wonder from a place of seeing my kid as like a teammate, not as a problem. And everything I do from there in terms of an intervention is going to actually be different than if I see my kid's behavior as a sign of their identity. And then everything there is going to come from control and an adversarial position. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And I think just playing a tape forward, you know, having a lot of uh, adults, um, you know, in my own community, a lot of us retain that, right? That just that uh, merger of my behaviors are me. And I actually, we just, Jenna and I released a podcast episode a couple of weeks ago that was really resonating with the community on the topic of shame. And how yeah. deep rooted so much of our shame is in adulthood. And I can imagine this is one of the trajectories, right? If I have had no space between, and again, oftentimes in, very, in a very well-intentioned household with parents and caregivers who were limited by, again, how they themselves were parented. Though what happens is we do begin to merge ourselves with our behaviors. And then we carry well into adulthood, this deep rooted feeling of unworthiness, of unlovability. 
um, that again attaches our worth with our actions and creating that space I think is and like going back to that first quote right pulling it back understanding what's driving it from that goodness there might be behaviors that we want to shift or change or or modify in any way but with that separation allows us I think to to break that pattern of shame I mean, I, yes, like a hundred percent to all of that. And I think, you know, for anyone listening, I think there's a group of people who are like, yes, that, that just feels better. Like my kid is good inside, of course. And I am good inside. And then there's another group of people and I have both these parts in me. We probably all do. That's just like, I'm just like focused on like effectiveness, like just like, like, like what, what's effective, right? Which I appreciate. Okay. There's nothing wrong with thinking that way. Here's the irony of it all. Like coming down harshly on your kid for their behavior your kid's going to tie that to their identity. They're going to think like, I got sent away when I hit my sister and I got punished. So like I, in order to get control, in order to get grounding, they have to tell themselves the story of badness, right? And then they have that shame experience. We we freeze in shame. Like, you know, right? Like we literally, our bodies freeze. Like, I don't know someone who would ever think a frozen state is conducive to movement. Like you literally, and if movement is change, like you literally can't change when you feel shame. Right. Like, you know, we've been trying for centuries to shame ourselves into change. <laughs> Doesn't seem to work. Not terribly effective because all of our energy has to go to self-preservation. If we feel bad inside, we, we have to like really, really shut down. So parents say, well, aren't you letting the kid off the hook? And again, the good inside approach has such firm boundaries to it. There's such parental authority without punishment, but you don't let a kid off the hook by not shaming them in punishment. I actually think you let them off the hook for change by punishing them because you've made them frozen. So if you want your kid never to change and you want them to be let off the hook, cool. Punish away, yell away, call them names. If you want your kid to be on the hook for growth and development and change, just from a pure effectiveness standpoint, we have to keep blame and shame out of it. We just have to. Right. You're right. I love this, this conversation because you write children who are left alone with intense distress often rely on two coping mechanisms, self-doubt and self-blame. And then you go on to say that parents, um, I love how you break down the job. So parents have the job of establishing safety through, you just use one of the words, through boundaries, through validation, through empathy. And children have the job of learning and exploring through experience and expressing their emotions. Yeah, I mean, right, like you work with so many adults, like and I've worked with so many adults. That's like the most interesting thing. People always ask me about my experience with child therapy. And I used to do that, but I actually feel like all my ideas about parenting come from my work with adults. I have never had an adult come to my office. I'm guessing you have into your office or to your community who says, my parents got all the frustration and anger out of me. Like they just, <laughs> they got it out and I never feel it again. And it's amazing. But we see so many adults who may not, may not say this, but essentially they're like, I am a 40-year-old who has the same coping skills as a, as a one-year-old. I never learned to cope, right? So like, you can't unfeel a feeling ever. You're going to have all the feelings for the rest of your life. So I would rather my kids get to the age of 18 and 40 and be like, wow, I have better coping mechanisms than I did when I was young because the feelings are coming my way. It's just a matter of if I'm prepared to cope or not. You can't protect people from those things. You just have to prepare them. And so your kid's job then, like their actual job in their younger years is to feel all the feelings because you can't learn skills for a feeling unless you have it, right? You got to go through the tunnel to do the learning. And so that's actually their job. And yeah, and, and a parent's job, and this is, I think everything always for me does come back to family jobs because that's the clarity, right? That's like, if you know what you need to do, even if it's hard, you feel okay. And we know that maybe not, we know, but the validation empathy piece is all the like, you're allowed to feel that way. And, and I get it. Right. Okay. So we can go into that more, but the other piece is the piece. I think that especially the media, like they, they never, they never represent well, because if a kid is having a massive tantrum or is hitting, if you go up to your kid, who's hitting her sister and you're just like, you're allowed to feel mad. Like, no, I do not give that my stuff of <laughs> approval. Like that would be very dysregulating for a kid who'd be like, do you see what I'm doing? Like, you're just going to let me keep pummeling my sister. No, the thing I think that is one of the differentiators about the good inside approach is the way that it teaches parents. And it's true, especially women to embody their authority and set firm 
boundaries for themselves and for their kids, which in that example would be, I will not let you hit your sister. And then there might be a physicality to it, not cruel, but you might have to actually remove your child. You might have to actually separate them or hold your daughter's wrist and say, I will not let you hit your sister. You're mad. I get it. We're going to have to figure out a different way because my job is to keep everyone safe. And right now that means separating you. That's actually like a really empowered position as a parent. That's from boundaries. You also empathize. You see the goodness in your kid. You're not sending them away. You're not saying hopefully what's wrong with you, but the boundaries piece the keeping people safe, the stepping in, the stopping the damage, the making key decisions. That's a really, really important part of kind of like good inside parenting as well. Yeah. Well, let's kind of dive into that just a bit deeper, if you don't mind, because what I'm as a fellow, you know, a a historic, I should say, boundaryless people pleaser, you know, very much embodying difficulty in all of those areas where, you know, the reason why I raised my hand so readily when you talked about being in a 40 year old body with no coping mechanisms, um, I disconnect it so long from very overwhelming emotions that when I'm hearing, you know, to, to parent, we have to have, I'm imagining a sense of safety with emotions in general, if we're going to be able to co-experience our child, right, going off the wall and being able to stay in that boundary safe space to offer that sturdy leadership. So just kind of imagining, and I know that a lot of the community really struggles in that same way with their own feelings, with creating safety, with creating boundaries, um, and don't feel necessarily comfortable doing that. So what is the, I guess, individual role of your own journey in your own emotional resilience and how can that translate over and how can we overcome some of the difficulties in trying to embody that role when it is difficult in our own lives? I know, big question. Yeah, well, this this like is the question, right? And I think it's what any parenting approach that's just about what to say to your kid or do, it misses the mark because the emotional place you'll be in in the moment that difficult thing happens is going to dictate kind of the circuit that gets activated in your body. And if that circuit is an old one (laughs) that is a reactive one, right? From your own history, then like, it doesn't even matter how much you've read a certain book, right? It's just not, it's literally not going to be available to you. So yeah, this is everything. And I think that as parents, if you, if you think about even that just example, like my kid just hit her sister, I think about that idea of stepping in and like embodying authority and like setting that firm boundary. And I also think about that other part of my job of looking at my kid, even in that moment, as a good kid having a hard time, not a bad kid doing bad things. I think that's actually the sole thing our kids absorb from us in the moment, which way we look at them. Um, Often we have trouble, we might have trouble with both, that's fine, still nothing wrong with you, but often we have more trouble with one side of that equation. Is it the like stepping in and the firm boundary? Is it the validation and the seeing the goodness under the kind of difficult behavior? And I think it's like a next step, we're gonna make this concrete. Like the things that are hard for us to give our kids are the things we clearly don't have in excess in our own body. Forget in excess. We might not even have at like a minimal, you know, way. So if you, let's say, like grew up in a family that never saw your emotional life, right? That you would have, if you know, yeah, if I would have hit my sister, I know exactly what would have happened. It would have been like, what's wrong with you? Why can't you be nice like your sister? Go to your room and come out when you have something nice to say. Okay. What does that mean? You just became your behavior in that moment. You just were defined by hitting. You are not a person who is having a hard time in that moment. You are a bit of bad thing and you're a bad kid. So if we think about what might've happened in your body, right? After that, well, you're in your room alone. And the only thing you have to kind of have control is self blame right? So what happens? You develop the circuit of like, if I just didn't feel mad or feel jealous or whatever the feeling was, and you, you blame yourself and you probably even create a part of you that yells at yourself, like in order to try to like stop you and help, you know, you function in your family. Okay. So now you're with your kids and you're thinking, okay, like now I'm an adult, right? I'm going to make different decisions. <laughs> and we do have, have that intention. <laughs> so you see this scenario. And I I always feel like what happens in the body is your body like scans and it's like of all your circuits, like, what do I know about this situation? Ah, Okay. And like a part is like, I know, I know exactly what to do. It's, it's confused. It's confused about the time. It's confused about what year it is, but especially if it's very practiced, it's very overzealous and it will jump. And that part of you is the one that says, what is wrong with you? You are so nasty. Right. And so even though you're thinking, 
oh, I just, read, I just read that book or, right, I just did this thing. Yeah, that circuit, you know, we, we just, we can't beat a part of us that was put in place to protect us until it feels over time like, um, like we're safe, you know? And so reparenting, and I know obviously that's a huge part of your work, but that idea of really like becoming aware of your body, becoming aware that you have real things inside you, they're real, even if you can't represent them in the way we represent other real things, not only are they real, they're important. There's messages for you. There, um, there's things that were never your fault. There's things that you still have a part of you screaming out that it needs. That's probably waiting for you as the adult now to give that work combined with then I think we all need a little like extra tip or script or strategy but that work I would think it helps you then access that strategy because it helps your body be able to be in a more grounded sturdy place realizing it's 2022 right it is 2022 I'm safe hi part of me that's trying to jump out okay I'm asking just some version of asking you to step back right I can do this one step at a time but that work First of all, it helps you feel better as a person. It's it's also the single best gift. It's like the best strategy <laughs> you could ever even use with your kids. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the the shame relieving aspect of it that I think some people even just hearing this will will receive, you know, that understanding of why. Because and again, I would see this in my clients week after week as as insight went up, right? As I understood my patterns, as I maybe even had a plan of action, this new thing I'm gonna do next time in that space before I'm actually able to embody this new experience in those really reactive moments when all of our neurobiology really is at that hair trigger like you're describing, those are the hardest times. And those are the times I think without understanding the why, again, that I am so wired in this adaptive, you know, actual biological, physiological response. That's why it does feel like it's over the limit, right? I've kind of reached that point, and this is how I describe it and I experience it myself, that point of no return, I call it. It's like there is a train chugging down those tracks and no amount of that insight is online anymore. No amount of that awareness yet right after the fact, damn, here comes all of the shame of what is wrong with me? How could I be so hurtful, so mean to either myself or again, if we're talking about children, to these humans that I love so much. So again, while it doesn't change the behaviors and big reason why I, I evolved my own practice, even my understanding and then my practice of embodying the physical person, the shell, the body, again, is because it's not enough, right? That shame, the understanding of where it came from can get us and relieve us maybe of that self-judgment of that shame, but we still have those, you know, really critical moments of how can I embody a new choice? And to speak to your point, I think that you wove in there, it's identifying the fact that we still, as a parent, have our own needs. Even if we do have a family of responsibility around us, we do reach a depleted state of energy, of physical, you know, of emotional resources that once they're gone, even though the family is still there in need of us in some way, we're really increasing the likelihood of that reactivity. A hundred percent, right? Like our triggers, yeah, it comes from our past and our old circuits, but also like there's a lot of present moment you know, stuff that comes into play too. And, you know, now we're really getting going, but this, this idea around it's parenthood, I think really it's like motherhood and femininity of, um, you know, this selflessness, you know, this yeah. giving, like there is nothing as disturbing to me as a selfless mother. Like the term selfless, like I actually find, like, I actually find it a disturb, like selfless, like without access to self. Like I can't imagine I'd ever want a pilot who like cannot access <laughs> their self or like definitely not. Like, that's like, oh, like you're just free floating. Like to me, I always say about people, like I'm attracted to people in life where I can like locate them. Like I can just look <laughs> where they are. That means like that person has access to self. Selfless parenting benefits zero people. Like I really mean that. Like yeah. it doesn't even benefit kids. Like the idea that a kid would benefit from seeing their parent just waste away and lose access to every part of them, except for maybe one, a caregiving part, which then of course you're in a constant cycle of depletion and not feeling fulfilled. Like, why would that be good for a child? In some ways they would just see themselves as like monstrous. Like, look what I just did my poor parent. I just destroyed their life, you know? So I just, I really call like major bullshit on that narrative. And 
the idea instead that like, I, I, I'm a parent of three kids, right? Being a parent, being a caregiver is of course, it's a huge part of my identity. It's a huge part of my decision-making, right? And like, there's other parts of me as well. And I think this goes back to that idea of family jobs so much and why it's so important is that if I think about my job as setting boundaries, kind of making these big decisions and validating and empathizing with my kids' feelings, my kids' job is to feel their feelings. Okay, this is like, there's there's often this like seesaw goes back and forth and we can see the way we can still kind of claim space for ourselves when you think about those jobs. So just the other night, I went to dinner with my husband and friends. Like that's important to me. Like that's really important to me. Do I do that every single night? I don't, because I think there's something to be with my kids and putting them to bed and being there. I did last night. My daughter did not like it. Wasn't a fan. Wasn't a fan of my decision. Okay. So she was, why do you have to go out? Why do you have to go out? Okay. Selfless parenting. I don't have a self. Okay. I guess I'll cancel plans. I'll actually make the reservation at 930, even though, I don't know. I don't know what adults go to dinner at 930. <laughs> but um, so if I go back to family jobs, my job is my decision and empathizing with her feelings. You can only empathize with someone's feelings if it's their feelings, not if they seep into yours. It is not my feeling that she's upset. That is her feeling. And her job is to feel her feelings. So if we played this out, I said some version, and I think this is the clear boundary with so many things we don't set as parents. I am going out to dinner. Here's why. I love being your mom. I really do. And I love so many of those nights we cuddle and I put you to bed. And I also love being a wife and being an adult and seeing my friends and having time with them when none of our kids are around. And so I am going to dinner. I know you're not happy. I get that. Like I, I hated when my parents went out to dinner too. And some version of you're allowed to be upset, right? My kids' feelings should not dictate my boundaries. And my boundaries should not dictate their feelings. Like just because I think it's a good decision, to go out to dinner, my daughter does not have to be on board with that decision and I don't need her blessing. Also, just because my kid's upset doesn't mean I made a bad decision and it definitely doesn't mean I have to change my decision. And actually, when our kids see that their feelings change a decision that we previously wanted to make, that feels really bad for them because essentially you feel like, oh, the feelings that feel so overwhelming and scary to me, like they actually are overwhelming and scary in the world because I just watched them come out of my body and actually go into my parents' body and change a decision. Like that's really terrifying for a kid. So like those family jobs, I think are always so grounding. And that idea of parenting at times is about allowing myself to make a decision, not just from a pouring myself out and caregiving part. It, it, it's so important for the whole family system. Yeah. I think you're really speaking to, you know, having, when I look back at my own, you know, past history of not having that separation of seeing and having that internalized belief that if I had worry or stress or upset in my life, really seeing how that impacted for me, my mom, don't worry me, or she would become just as scared alongside of me for the impact, whatever experience I was have was having on me, you know, and without that separation, I very much internalized that idea, even to this day, there's many moments where I struggle making choices or decisions to care for myself and for my needs or express my feelings because I play that tape out. Oh, this is going to impact this person and probably in a way that's not really positive and, you know, very much trailing it back to having that domino like experience and imagining them from a childlike perspective of how even more scary that must have been because acknowledging that scare emotions for children are big. They are overwhelming. We do need that stable, secure caregiver to literally at times help our body feel safe enough to even be in it while those feelings are happening. And then when you do see a parent or experience them fleeing or diminishing or reacting to how you're feeling, you do get that lack of, of separation and you actually write something really beautiful um, in the way you define confidence. And I think this kind of wraps up into this conversation of feeling. And you say confidence is actually not about feeling good at all. I think a lot of times we do have this idea that we put confidence in this, you know, positive, I'm exuding the self-assuredness around good feelings. And so you go on to say confidence is not about feeling good. It's our ability to feel at home with ourselves in the widest range of feelings possible. 
And it's built from the belief that it's okay to be who you are, no matter what you're feeling and just kind of extending on this. And we don't impact the world as negatively as maybe we once did. That okayness, I think, is embodied in that too, that I can have a big overwhelming experience and my environment, my relationship can contain it. Yes, that's it. That's, you know, and, and I remember, I, so I always remember I was in this like really small seminar in college and there was this one girl who was like, she just was smarter than the rest of us, you know, like, it's okay. Like I'm not, just, she was like, really everything she said is so brilliant. <laughs> and there was a period where the, the, the instructor was like talking about something. I honestly don't remember what it was. And I remember internally just being like, I actually have no idea what this instructor, I don't really understand this, but I was like, I'll catch up later or something. And I looked around the room, <laughs> like, I'll figure it out. And this girl put up her hand. And she was just like, I'm sorry. Like, I, I really can't follow what you're saying. I'm super confused. Like, is there any way you could just go back and say that a different way? And like, if I think of one experience I have that to me, like really epitomizes confidence, it's like that moment. Like it wasn't even the smart stuff that girl said at other points in the seminar. Like she trusted that she was confused. Like she trusted Mm -hmm. that she really was confused. And in order to even say something, you also have to feel like I'm a good, smart person, even when I am confused. Like I'm at home with myself in confusion and I trust that feeling. Like that's what I want for my kids, right? Like I want my kids to do that in a seminar or to be in a situation where someone's saying to them like, hey, it's not a big deal. Come on, do this. And they're like, you know what? My, my body's telling me it's a big deal. So like, I trust that and no, like that's confidence. And it doesn't get built when you're 18 or 30. Although we can build it then hundred percent. I just mean, it doesn't have to start then. It's why when our kids are younger, like seeing what's going on inside them as real, even if we don't understand it. And I always think like, just that those words, like I, Hey, I don't even understand what you're upset about, but like, I believe you, like, I believe you, you're about, you are upset. Like I see it and I believe you. And I always say like one of the things I try to say as much as I can to my kids is like, you're the only one in your body. So you're the only one who could ever know how you're feeling, or you're the only one who can know what you want or what you like. It doesn't mean I give them the 30 shows that they want to watch or whatever it is, but they know they want it. They know they feel. And I think reframing confidence in that way, like, I think like what a gift if my kids go into adulthood, really, if the only thing they end up saying to themselves is like, I'm the only one in my body, I'm the only one who can know, like how I feel and what I want. Like, I don't care what they learn in high school or college. Like, I feel like they'll, they'll be ahead of the game. (laughs) I could not agree more. I mean, going back to what I began with, right. If I localize my intuition, right, this internal guidance in my body, then that means that I need to have that connection. I need to be able to hear, you know, those pains of, you know what, this doesn't actually feel safe or good for me right now. And then furthermore, I have to learn that I can trust those pings that I have that space. And I think what you're beautifully describing is kind of that. And um, you bring up the concept of having an and when you talk about multiplicity or allowing, you know, two realities, but we can even apply another and here, right? I can hold space for this big, overwhelming, scary feeling my child is having. And I can do so empathetically. I can validate it. I know you're having a really big feeling right now. And I still, my job is to have a boundary to keep you safe. I think that's a really beautiful illustration of expanding and saying, all of this is true. You're having a big overwhelming feeling that makes you feel like you want to hit or punch or, you know, do something off the wall that, and I can help you contain, I can put us together. If I have the resources to be safe for you in this moment, or I can rejoin you when I am in a safe space. And, and now I can allow the child to have that confidence to have that internal, okay, my feelings are big, are overwhelming. That's being validated. They're valid and real and alive for me right now. And now I'm given some options. I'm being shown other ways that I can even over time contain myself. Yes. That, that idea that, and that I always think like these two things as true. Um, it's like, I feel like it's the answer to like all the questions in life is like, okay. Like I was going to say in life for us adults too, in a lot of ways. Is. It's like, <laughs> right. It probably is. Cause when we can't hold two things as true, we do become so myopic and like life feels really overwhelming when you're looking at the world in that way. Right. So like, yeah, I won't let you hit, or even I won't let you hit your sister. You can hit that pillow or I won't let you hit. And you're allowed to be mad, really mad, huge mad. And one of my jobs is going to be to show you and help you express and feel anger in a way that still feels safe. Because the other thing we forget about kids when they're acting out in this way, 
right? He's like, it doesn't feel good to them to be hitting, to be throwing. Like nobody feels good when they're in a hurricane, like nobody. And like, I think if we're honest with ourselves, like when you're really, if you were like going around your house, destroying every room and throwing things all over the place because you were just so dysregulating, like it really is an act of love if someone near you takes you to a smaller room and sits with you and just like, I'm not going to let you destroy the world. Like you're not going to end up like, I will, I will help you. It's a form of help. And yes, that multiplicity, like I'm stopping the behavior. I see the good kid. I won't let you do this. You can do this. Or I think a huge one is, yes, I'm making this decision. And yes, you're allowed to have whatever reaction you're allowed to have, you know, you're going to have about it. Like that's a big two, two things are true. TV time is over and you're allowed mm-hmm. to be upset, yeah. you know, like, and I think that doing it like this, like it really helps us visualize that boundary, like my decision, mm-hmm. kid feelings. And you can even watch mm-hmm. for the temptation to be like, oh, so upset, I guess. Is it, is it a big deal to watch one more show? And if you want to watch one more show, let your kid watch one more show, be my guest. But that should come from a place of your decision-making, not your kid's, you know, overwhelming feelings. And to watch how those two things want to come together. Ooh, that, that my kid's sad feelings is about to bleed into my decision. Like, oh, like, just like get that space again. Like there are two different things happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, to speak to what I imagine again is very well-intentioned parents who might be trying to do the opposite. I can imagine all of you know, us out there who didn't have the present um, physically or emotionally present caregivers who very much vow, right, from that very early place to not do that to their child and to be, you know, there and, and to tend to their child's needs. I do think sometimes something that very comes from the parent's own, right, pain childhood very well intentionally can turn into what I would call it an an overcompensation or kind of a going to another extreme, again, with a very well-intentioned thought in our minds, but in execution, it it kind of prevents that separation. It prevents in these moments, the ability to, to stay, you know, in that boundary, safe, even contained way. And it kind of just throws you right in there, maybe with your child feeling just as overwhelmed in the scenario. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, I do, I always come back to me, like if I'm really overwhelmed and if I have my partner next to me, I want him to see that I'm upset. Like if I'm super worked up, I want him to like see that as real and to care about it. But if my feelings become like contagious to him now, like I've just doubled my feelings. Like that wouldn't feel good at all. Right. And, and I think there's some idea like empathy is like that merger in some way, like empathy is not a merger. You can't empathize with someone you've merged with. There's no one to empathize with. There's like just the porousness has just like come into each other. So empathy requires a boundary. Like it really requires even remind yourself, wait, wait, my kid was left out of recess. I was not, maybe I was in my past. I got, that's again, that self-work. My kid is really sad. Of course, no one likes to see their kid sad. That didn't happen to me. Like that didn't happen to me. My kid actually needs to see that I see that pain. Yes. And I need to not be in that pain. Exactly. I need to walk beside her in it, but I don't need to take on that pain. If I do, it's like, like like the, the pain deleting the pain, like, you know, it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't help your kid. Right. So I think that's, that's so important because we can be warm and caring and loving. In fact, to be warm and caring and loving, you actually have to have a boundary or else if you take on your kids' feelings as your own, we're not even really parenting them. Now, everything we do is really in the service of just our own feelings. They kind of, they kind of disappear anyway. Right. I was going to say in, in a sense, right, what I'm hearing and the way my mind kind of understands it and conceptualize it is in that moment now, we've actually deleted our child. It's about us in childhood being left out of recess. I mean, just to use, you know, right. That example, it's kind of like, okay, now this isn't actually me even tending to your feelings. And I agree with you. I think empathy has gotten confused um, as a concept and especially around this idea of being a highly sensitive person or an attuned individual, which I believe all humans are. We have energetic readers or connections to all of the environment around us, including other people. And again, I think what is often being described and labeled as highly sensitive or empathetic is that merger, is that lack of boundaries that began again in childhood that turned into this hypervigilant scanning and attuned nature, again, of self-protection. But if we really just want to objectively simplify it in that moment now, your crisis, your survival is your soul for focus and your child in a sense, in that moment, isn't present 
at all. So true empathy isn't necessarily there again, but we are labeling it as selfless as tending um, to our child and as, as coming from that space. So this, I think goes into what you and I were talking a bit about before I hit record, which is really honoring, right? The individualized human behind the parent, right? In this good, good inside parenting, which I believe is life-changing, um, transformational approach, because I think that's what we're all kind of just, what this conversation is about is we have a human, that's the parent that came from all of these past layering, conditioning experiences that in these moments, right, sometimes even take us out of the parenting role and right back into our own childhood wounding. It, it really does. That's, that's exactly right. And it's why I think we, me and you connect and why we're like, wow, our work is like so similar, you know, um, like mm -hmm. the language and the examples are slightly different, right? But yeah, I mean, as a parent, I, of course we get triggered over and over by our kids, right? We go through this like widest range of experiences with them and right, our body kind of scans our own body and thinks about all the things we've learned. And that's what really jumps up to respond first. And so I don't know one parent who isn't triggered like that, like me included, like, you know, just to like put it out there, like, don't think I do all mm -hmm. the things that Dr. Becky says to do. Mm -hmm. I do not. Don't hold me to that standard. Um, and you know, that's, that's also why though, I think being a parent, like it, it can offer just so many amazing opportunities for like self-growth. And I think, you know, people say sometimes in my community, and I always have an interesting reaction, like I'm here to do like all this learning and be, be a better parent to my kid. And that's an amazingly noble goal. But I always say like, I don't know why I always feel like what's missing is like, okay, can you be here to be like, I just feel like I deserve to feel like a more grounded, sturdy person. Like that's going to hugely benefit my kids. And yeah, I want to learn the little strategies and tips and scripts. Sure. But like I'm here because I deserve to just like feel better inside. Right. And I think like that's been lost. I don't know if it was ever found, but it, it was lost forever in motherhood. Like maybe like where the generation who's reclaiming, like when I become a mother, I don't lose all the other parts mm -hmm. of me. And I don't just need to do things and change things just for my kid. Probably the things I'm going to do and change for myself are going to be the things that go hand in hand that benefit my kids. So there's just like a nice synergy and efficiency there. But like, I, I just deserve that as a person, right? And I think that's so important to like, to reclaim that and to really redefine motherhood and parenthood with that in mind. And all of this, I think kind of goes beautifully full circle, right? If those of us that are becoming aware of ourselves and the self, do we even have one? Again, speaking from my own experience of not, Right. You're like, you're saying this idea of selfless modeling that's very much no boundaries is what I saw from every adult human in, in my, in my family. So not having right, this separate, this separate being the separate self and really acknowledging how few I'll go as far as to say that of us, even in adulthood who have that internal sense of goodness for us of being, you know, a, a human who is worth, whether doing this for our role as a parent or maybe our role in our relationships as general or any choice that we make gesturing to ourselves, I think really does activate a, a pretty universal, um, as far as I'm learning now, having very much access to individuals around the globe, as I know you do too, I'm seeing that really core similarity that so few of us really feel worth it, really feel worth of any journey you know, in terms of self defining a self, self improvement, wellness, whatever it is that we want to call it, or forever the byproduct will be my child, my relationship, whatever. Again, it, it is coming to the surface for many different generational reasons, you know, resource based reasons that very few of us, to go as far to say, have had this sturdy type modeling and leadership and really do feel worth it. So I think, in and of itself, that's the first challenge um, is acknowledging the self that we make, we do feel less than we do, we do feel is unlovable. And again, we can understand under where it came from, though. I think that is the reality that a lot of us adults are living into. Okay. I think you're exactly right. And, you know, one thing I want to make sure to get in here for everyone who's a parent. And honestly, I think this is true for people who aren't a parent and are in a relationship with someone with themselves is like, I think the single most important thing to get really good at as a parent is repair, is repair. And 
repair is, is like the best strategy because if you think about it, if you're repairing and if it's really important to get good at repair, well, if you're getting good at repair, you're still messing up because you have nothing to repair for if you didn't mess up. <laughs> it was like a very like humanizing strategy and a humanizing idea. Like you're going to be misattuned with your kid. You're still going to yell at your kid, right? And then repair is just, it's the most important thing. And I think that what we always say at Good Inside, it's like, number one is repairing with yourself. Like we cannot repair with a child or with a partner before we've repaired with ourselves. And repair doesn't have to mean that doesn't matter or I'm sorry, just an I'm sorry. I think repair is actually for yourself, like finding your goodness internally under this thing you did. Like, and I, I always say like, as a parent, I, I tell parents like, before you go to your kid's room to say sorry for something, like go into a bathroom, like put your hand on your heart and like, remind yourself, like, I'm a good parent who is having a hard time. I'm like, probably if you say that to yourself over and over, like, especially connected to your body, like you will tear, like something will happen in your body because it's probably a deep message. Like we all needed to hear for, for so long and then go to your kid. Like, and I know me and you, Nicole, both like think obviously about the body all the time. Like when something happens with your kid that didn't feel good, like you yell at your kid, it lives in their body. Like their body can't forget it. Like it, it's stored there, but that doesn't have to be awful. Like if that's part of a chapter in their life, when you repair, you like go back to that moment in their body and like kind of open up the file. And now you can like end that file so differently. Like it's like such an amazing opportunity. And you can always do that a day later, or you could do that years later. Like I'm sure me and you, Nicole, right? If our parents called us now and we're like, I have to tell you, I've been thinking about this thing that happened 30 years ago. I, that probably felt really bad for you. That was never your fault. Like, I am so sorry. And I'm open to hearing your experience about it. Whatever they said, like that would, it, that would still mean something like mess. <laughs> right. And so repair, like if a parent is watching this, like probably, I think it's true in any relationship, like take one thing, like find your kid at some point today or tomorrow and just say some version of, I'm sorry for X, or I've been thinking about why it's never your fault when I yell, or it wasn't your fault. And I'm working on whatever it's I'm working on, you know, managing my feelings too. That probably felt scary. I'm working on it. And I love you like that, that repairs, that reconnects. It goes back to that building confidence and building worth. Cause you're showing your kid, like you don't have to internalize that self-blame and like you are worthy of reconnection. Like it's just, it's a huge bang for your buck strategy. Yeah. I, I love this. And I, I really want to commend you um, for speaking as honestly as you do of yourself and your own parenting. Cause I even see, you know, in my community, when I share, like you're saying like, Oh, I, Dr. Nicole can say all of these things. And in real time, Dr. Nicole doesn't always do all of those things, right? So I think, it, and I, I am always really struck um, by those moments where I'm sharing, whether it's, you know, in the circle or on a podcast or what have you. And I see then messages and comments come in of how healing it is to even hear, right? That reality that, yeah, you know, these are ideas, concepts, and in action, it's hard to be human. They, I have those same triggers. I have those same moments of, you know, losing my mind and acting in ways that are very, very shameful. And right. I'm human, just like the rest of us and understanding and seeing, you know, that you, how much and readily you offer that to the community and then translating that to these moments as well, right. Not having the fear as a parent to say, you know what, I, I did scream and yell at you, you know, child, and it doesn't, doesn't mean anything about you. That's not any way that, you know, I, I should have taken my feelings out and right here I am giving you that acknowledgement. And I do think for many different reasons, um, we haven't had that modeled to us. And those are the moments that we're, you know, avoiding because of our own shame. But those are the moments that I think are so greatly impacted, impactful for, for everyone around us. Think about even applying that in our, in our relationships with other adults. Um, you know, going back to that moment. And like you're saying, I, I would know, right, if we, a parent came and tried to address something well into adulthood, it would alive in that as if it was right back there and talk about really changing then your neurobiological relationship um, with that ev event. And I'm really happy you speak to this because I do often hear, you know, people who are, you know, older in life, like having this fear of it's too late. Oh, I've already, my children are already adults themselves. I'm watching them parent. And you know, I'm having all of these reactions to it. And what I feel and think is so inspiring about your work is really understanding that it's never too late to understand ourselves and to create change in our, in our relationships. I mean, yes, 
it's not too late is like just such a core mantra, you know, and it, and it's, it's not bullshit. Like, it's just, it's true. Like it's too late. It's a common fear. And I do think sometimes when parents worry about that with their kids, like, I do feel like there's something they're really fearing that in themselves. Like, is it too late for me? (laughs) Right. Like it's not too late for your kid. It is not too late for you are, yes, I feel like it's another two things are true. Our brain, our body wires early and it's always open. And I always feel like eager, like thirsty for that rewiring. So like, yeah, it takes work. It takes some consistency. It takes some like really small, but consistent steps. And like, we can do those things. Like, especially when we have support and, you know, when we are surrounded by other people who are cheerleading us in that or doing that alongside of us, um, it's really, really possible. Yeah, absolutely. And to speak to that point, I just want to highlight again, um, your amazing new book, Good Inside. And really, you know, not only did you describe so much of what we chatted about today, you know, foundationally, um, the ins and outs of understanding these different concepts in terms of parenting and attachment and repair and what's going on inside of us when we're having feelings. Um, I really appreciate, Dr. Becky, how you go into actual objective right, concerns, like the child who can't sleep being someone I remember many memories of childhood laying in bed at night, fearful, bumps in the night, worried my mom wasn't going to you know, wake up. I was also the painfully shy child. You devote a really um, incredible chapter of understanding shyness, of understanding sibling dynamics and food related issues. So again, I can't talk more highly of Good Inside. Um, I devoured it, like I shared with you before this hard copy even came to me. Your team had shared with me um, the Kindle version and I was nearly done it when this arrived because I just thought it was so incredibly impactful. And again, I'm someone who doesn't have a child um, myself and the concepts in here to be able to, in my own mind's eye, go back to my own childhood. And again, not shaming or judging my parents and how they chose or were able to show up in those moments, but it gave my inner child a new sense of awareness. And then my inner parent that I'm continuing to cultivate for myself, um, a new opportunity to change the way that I'm relating to myself um, in those moments of activation. So imagining all the parents of the world, getting their hands on these books and on this book and not only having, like I said, these concepts, but them translate it. Um, you give scripts and dialogues and break things down into just really understandable steps and amazing, amazing practical content. So thank you for not only this book, um, for your amazing community, for your new membership that I know that you have out in the world. And I just, I'm so impressed um, by you, Dr. Becky, and, and how you're showing up. And literally, as I always say, the ripples that are created now in the world Um, talk about global change. Um, I'm just so inspired by you and your work. So thank you for everything that you do and for offering this amazing book to all of us. And right back at you and more. So really, and thank you for having me. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you for your support way before my book too. So um, I love, always love talking with you. Can't wait for the next one. Yeah, same, same. And anyone who's listening, um, we'll make sure that all of your contact information, where to buy the book, where to connect with you on all of the social media platforms um, and to connect with your community is all linked down below. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you as always for all of you tuning in. And we will definitely be connecting sometime in the future, you and me.